anti-depression pill. Sunshine, lollipops and rainbows, everything is... Hello, Christ on all, welcome back. This week we are going to be looking at women in the Viking Age. This is probably the first of several videos I'm going to do on this subject, but today is uh, March the 8th, or this video is coming out on March the 8th, 2021, which is International Women's Day. So we are going to look at some of the things that we know about women in the Viking Age, and some of the things that we don't know about women in the Viking Age, because we think we know an awful lot, but in reality, mm, there's a lot of stuff we're not too sure about. So. Let's take a little look-see. So what we're going to look at today is we're going to look at the evidence that we have from the Viking Age on how women lived their lives and what role women played in society. And we actually have quite a lot... Oh, no, I did. We actually have quite a lot of evidence for what women did in the Viking Age. So let's take a quick tour through that. So obviously the main source of archaeology that we have for individual people's lives is graves and grave goods. And some people are skeptical about how much we can actually learn from grave goods, but they are a really valuable source of information. And many of the grave goods that we have for Viking Age women include really important clues for how they were viewed and what they did. So we know, for example, from many of the graves uh, around Hedeby <clears throat> that women were involved heavily in spinning. So spinning yarn from animal fibres and plant fibres of course. We have lots and lots, in fact we have thousands of spindle walls. Spindle walls are the weights that you put on a hand spindle or a drop spindle. So when you want to spin the cloth you effectively you tie the cloth, <laughs> the cloth, oh my god, oh my god, oh, the drugs, the drugs, they're kicking in. You tie the yarn that you're making onto the end of the spindle and then you spin it around and that uh, spins the fibres and they effectively stick together because they're magic. And if you're spinning more than one fibre, you spin the spindle and it plies them together. And that's how you get two ply, three ply, four ply yarn. It's by spinning all those things together. The vast majority of the spindle walls that we find in graves are in the graves of women, which heavily implies that women were kind of the people in charge of spinning yarn. We also find things like bone sword, uh, not bone swords, oh my god, <laughs> I can't talk today. Why can't I talk today, man, bah. Oh. We also find things like weaving swords, which are pieces of metal or wood or actually bone, I think we have some bone ones, haha, -ha, I was right, that you use effectively to beat the fabric that you're weaving to get it nice and tight, because you don't want all of the fibres sitting on the on the loom like that, you want them to be sitting on the loom like that, so it's a nice tight fabric, so you have to beat them into submission. And the majority of these are found associated with women. We find things like needles, we find loom weights, we find various things that suggest that women were responsible for not just spinning and weaving, but also all forms of textile production. So tapestry, nolbind, tablet weaving, the production of clothes, the decoration of clothes. We know from contemporary work in Ireland that much of this aspect of life was considered women's work. Obviously today, if we use the term women's work, it's usually used as a kind of derogatory term. Say, oh, that's something that was relegated to women. But in the Viking Age, it seems like this kind of work was incredibly important. The number one tradable material in Europe at that time was wool. And if you don't have wool textiles, you're at a severe disadvantage, especially in Scandinavia and Northern Europe, where you need wool to keep warm. You need wool. You absolutely have to have it. If you're living in somewhere like Iceland, where you have all these amazing pile-woven cloaks and garments being made, you need a lot of that stuff to be produced, and you need people who can produce it efficiently and effectively. So far from just being simple, boring women's work, this is a highly skilled craft. It takes a long time to perfect, it takes a long time to practice, and it's very, very valuable. It's central to the economy of almost every country in early medieval Europe, is wool production and textile production. The use of tablet weave with silver wire in it, like we find in the Osseberg ship, suggests that tablet weaving 
is a very, very expensive and well thought of craft. So tablet weaving, if you've never tried it, takes a long time to get good at. Unless you're my friend Barbara, who just picks it up straight away and very irritatingly makes the most beautiful tablet weave you've ever seen. Most mortals take a long time to get good at tablet weaving. And there's what we call brocaded tablet weave, which involves effectively a second layer of weave, usually in the Viking Age made out of a precious metal, so silver or gold. This is stuff that we find in high-status burials. And from what we can tell, it's generally produced by women. So women are making these really high-class, high-status goods. They're effectively making very rich things worth a lot of money. And if somebody is capable of making those sorts of high-end products in the medieval period, they will be considered a skilled craftsperson. Another thing that we get lots and lots and lots of evidence for is that women were responsible for running the household in the Viking Age. And in Viking societies, societies where men went viking, and we believe that the term vikinger was only used for men, unfortunately, linguistically, and from what we can tell, it was a term applied to men. But we do have enough evidence that women were considered really prominent members of society in some areas and at certain times. The Osseberg burial from around the 830s is a double female burial in a ship. You do not get buried in a ship unless you are a, very wealthy, and B, very important. She's surrounded by tapestries, she's got textiles and pillows, she's got a tablet weaving loom that's all warped up and ready to be used, suggesting that she, as a noble or high-born or elite woman, was producing this high-end um, decorative material. Possibly she was making her own tablet weave, but we don't know. We have women buried with weapons, and weapons, especially swords, in the early medieval period are a symbol not necessarily of warrior status, but of high status. So it doesn't necessarily mean that you are fighting with that sword. It means that you are considered a high enough member of society to wield a sword, or to own a sword. Everyone's going to talk about burqa. We have no idea who the burqa woman was. We are still debating the osteology of that, and I'm not going to comment either way. One of the other places we get evidence, apart from graves, is rune stones. So rune stones are a really important Viking Age source of writing. The Vikings and the early medieval Norse tended not to write books, but we do have runes and runic inscriptions that we can use. And I've got a couple here. My favourite one is probably this one. Uh, this is the that was originally erected in Gran in Norway, and the inscription is really nice. It just says, uh, Gunvor Thridrik's daughter made the bridge, there was a bridge next to where the stone was, in memory of her daughter Astrid. She was the most skilled maiden in Haderland. So the most skilled or the handiest maiden in Haderland suggests that she was very skilled in whatever work she was doing, and at the time it was probably textile related. There's a theory that the decoration on the stone might reflect her embroidery skills. And the stone actually shows uh, a scene from the book of Matthew. It shows the birth of Jesus Christ from the Bible. Uh, he's there in the barn being uh, worshipped and adored in his little manger. It also has uh, figures of men riding horses and, and various other figures. I think this is absolutely lovely. It's a memorial stone to somebody's daughter um, that was erected by a woman. So a woman commissioned this for a woman and it's just brilliant. It also tells us that a woman made the bridge next to this runestone. Uh, it's not likely that the woman whose name is Gunvor just made the bridge on her own. She probably had it commissioned, had it built by craftspeople. So there are lots of things that we can extrapolate, that we can learn from this gravestone, from this memorial stone, I should say, that Gunvor was a woman with the means to build a bridge and also to erect a very tall stone. It's taller than a human being. And that her daughter, <coughs> goodness me, Astrid, was a handy, skilled woman who was well-received and well-thought-of in her community. But we've got more than this one. We've got the Odin... I can't remember the name of it. Odendisa. We've got the Odendisa 
But we've got more than just one runestone. We've also got the Odendisa runestone, which uh, was discovered in Vestmanland in Sweden. So it's from quite far away from the previous one. Um, it was made around 1050, so another late-ish Viking Age uh, runestone. Uh, and it says, uh, The good husbandman Holmgauter had this stone raised in memory of Odendisa, his wife. There will come to Hasmyra no better housewife who arranges the estate. Red Bali carved these runes. Odindisa was a good sister to Sigmunder. So, Holmgauter, a local husbandman, a, a local animal breeder, um, obviously a really important person in a society like this where having enough animals to eat and breed uh, and use for materials <clears throat> was critical to the survival of the community has raised this really beautiful runestone. He's commissioned Bali, Red Bali, Bali the Red, to carve this runestone. And it's almost always a specialist rune carver or rune master who makes these stones. And his his wife, Odindisa, runs the estate. So Holmgauter, the husbandman, looks after the animals. Odindisa is in charge of the estate. And that comprises the house, any enslaved people working there, the general household accounts, textile production, food production, if there are any children, foster children or family members, she has complete authority over them. So running the estate is a very important job. If Holmgauter ever went on a Viking raid, Odindisa would be left in charge of the house. If he dies, she is in charge of the house and the family business. So we know that when Viking men and Norse men died, if they had a business, a trading business or a farm or a large estate, as uh, Hasmira seems to be, the woman of the house takes over, and she is solely in charge of that estate, she is solely in charge of the business, she is the boss. The last runestone I want to look at uh, is going to be Upland Runic Inscription 605, and if you want to look at um, runes there is a runic database it's called rune data and i'll link to it in the description of the video here and it's trying to make up a database of all of the runic inscriptions from scandinavia the scandinavian runic database and it's amazing to read through most of them have english translations if you need that um they have the old norse they have some of the more modern translations as well which i think is just fantastic so 605 is a lost rune stone tragically but uh it was found at Stalekit in uh, Upland. It references a woman called Ingirun Harder's daughter. And it says Ingirun or Iskirun Harder's daughter had these runes carved in memory of herself. She wants to travel to the east and abroad to Jerusalem. Futter carved these runes. So, again, this is a woman commissioning a runestone, which looks to have been a very attractive runestone. Um, it's, it's a woman who wants to go to Jerusalem. So it's a Christian Norse woman who wants to go on a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. That is something that you cannot do without serious cash, without access to a boat, without access to the trading routes that take you to Jerusalem, without access to the protection that you need on the road. So it's potentially possible that Ingirun Harderstotir was a wealthy established businesswoman who had converted to or was Christian and who wanted to go on e well, either a pilgrimage or a trading trip to Yursala, Jerusalem. It was called Yursala um, in the Old Norse. So we've got graves, we've got rune stones, we've got all of this information that women were engaged not just in producing things, they were involved in trading, they were involved in travel, they were commissioning uh, memorials, they were building bridges, they were in charge of their entire household, they had the right to divorce, as far as we can tell, but we're going to move on now to a few things that we don't know. So, things that we don't know about the Viking Age vastly outweigh what we know. I mean, it's crazy how little we know about the Viking Age from the Viking Age. We have almost no written evidence of how the Viking Age worked from the people involved in it. We have commentaries from later, we have commentaries from other peoples, but we have so little to go on. And one of the prime examples of that is the number of people who say, oh, what about Ibn Fadlan? Yes, Ibn Fadlan travelled to Northern Europe. He travelled to the Volga, and he might have been talking bollocks. And yet, 
it's used as evidence of all of these things that people talk about in the Viking Age, like tattooing and massive trousers and ritualised assaults and the way funerals worked and all of this stuff. He could have been writing nonsense. Like, he could have just been lying. People lie. <laughs> Somebody put a comment on one of my videos that was like, oh, maybe he thinks people lied a thousand years ago. Oh, uh, yeah, bud. People have been lying since time immemorial. Get real. So one of the things that we don't know is how magic and religion worked. We have clues, we can extrapolate a lot, but we don't know a lot for certain. So we know things like women have been buried with things that we think are magic. We think that some of the keys buried with women may have had some kind of talisman, uh, talismanic meaning, they may have related to the unlocking of secrets, they may have just been used to unlock the money chest and the coffer in their house, but again, that implies that they had great authority. So either way, it means something, right? Women have also been found buried with what has been interpreted as a vulva stick or staff. And the vulva or the seeress is seen as a magical ritualistic figure in Old Norse religion. It's a woman who has special access to certain knowledge. Later on, I think in the 11th or 12th century, we have a reference to women making a sacrifice to the elves in Scandinavia and a Christian not being allowed to witness it. So there were some things that were kept secret, there were things that have simply been lost to the mist of time. We don't know how they worked as priestesses or as seeresses. We don't know. We know that religion was practiced in outdoor spaces, we know that it was practiced in religious buildings, we know that it was probably practiced in the home, but how a woman featured in those practices and rituals, we don't know, we'll never know, unless we find a runestone that says, this is how you sacrifice something to Freya, this is how you make the sacrifice at the full moon at this time of the year. We don't know. We have later sources, Things like the sagas, but the Icelandic sagas, are heavily romanticised. Okay, that's like trying to use a Victorian romantic novel about the medieval period to learn about the medieval period. It's difficult. It's written by Christians in Iceland 200 years after the Viking Age. Not reliable source material. Important. Not reliable. Useful. Are not reliable. One of the other things we don't know about is women in warfare. People are going to ask me about shield maidens, and people are going to talk about things like the Valkyrie from Horby. Like, the Horby Valkyrie is a small figurine of a woman holding a sword and shield with her hair drawn back into a ponytail. We also have a Danish figurine that may or may not represent the goddess Freya. Uh, it may or may not re represent a woman. It is difficult to know, with hair and a bun. So, buns. They were a thing. Shaved heads, not a thing. Buns, a thing. Don't come at me, I can't be bothered. Were shield maidens real? We have no idea. John Skulitzes is a Byzantine writer who mentions seeing women armed after a battle lying dead on a battlefield. That's a battle against the Kievan Rus, that's not a battle being fought by Scandinavian Vikings or Norsemen. Uh, we do not know. The great heathen army that rampaged through England uh, it's been suggested that there were women involved in it because we found women skeletons. Yeah, we've also found children skeletons. It was an army, but it also had all of the baggage and all of the followers and all of the people associated with a large mass movement of people. They weren't just raiding, they were also tra trading, they were also settling. So, we don't know. We have no solid evidence of trained warrior women from the Viking Age. We have none. We don't. We do have women's burials with swords in them, which kind of implies that women were involved in fighting, but equally, it's grave goods, we don't know, it's difficult to know, it's really difficult to know, and yes, the grave in Burka, to me, if it is a woman, if it was a woman that was buried there, if, it, if that is a woman's skeleton, it suggests to me that that is a woman who was riding a horse and who possessed a war axe and a sword or was at least granted these things, or bought these things, as a symbol of her status. Elizabeth I 
has been portrayed carrying swords and wearing armour. She was never at the head of an army in battle. Difficult to know. We do have uh, people like Ethelfled, Lady of Mercia, who died in 918, AD 918, who was a war leader. Being a war leader is probably something that Norse women were doing. Women fought. Women fought in battles. Women fought in warfare. Women fought in sieges. Was there a trained band of warrior women like Lagatha that Saxo Grammaticus writes about several centuries afterwards? Eh, maybe. Who knows? We don't know. We don't know. We have to be comfortable saying that we don't know, and we have to be comfortable saying that we don't have evidence for stuff. Because otherwise you just end up making making up crap about history, and that's not my jam. So, we don't know. Um, we have no idea. One thing that we do know about women in the Viking Age is that they seem to have had more rights than women in certain other societies, so they could divorce, as far as we can tell. Um, they had the right to take over the business, as we discussed. They were in charge of the household. They were certainly involved in trading and mercantile journeys. We have evidence of spindle wools and needles from Lanzo Meadows, suggesting that women went over to the New World. They went over to Vinland, to Canada. Um, so, were women involved in Viking raids? I mean, we we probably know that women weren't Vikinger, but were they there? I mean, if you're going to do any settling, then yeah, hell yeah, absolutely. Women and children went on these on these settlements. Women and children were involved in these fleets. They had to be. They had to be. So there you go. That is kind of uh, my two cents, they call it, don't they? That's my halfpenny worth on Women in the Viking Age Part 1, let's call this, because I'm sorry this is a really general video. I've had a really bad week and I'm really tired, but you guys needed a video. And I wanted to give you guys a little video for International Women's Day. So I hope you've enjoyed this. Um, I hope that this has been... A nice jumping off point for you. I'm linking to a book by Professor uh, Judith Yesh, who is a professor at the University of Nottingham, because she is one of the authorities on runic studies and on women in the Viking Age. So I, I highly recommend you read her work if you want to learn more about this subject. Uh, it's a really great starting point. There was something else I was going to say, and I can't remember what it was. Maybe editing Jimmy will remember and put it on the screen for me, but I've completely forgotten. Uh, no. Nope, it's gone. Oh well. Um, and, uh, oh, phrase of the day, phrase of the week, I forgot. So the phrase of the week this week is Roy er fittil an a tor. Roy er fittil an a tor. Which means putting the violin in the roof. And it means giving up. So you know how if you go into your attic, you find like a load of stuff that your granddad put up there 50 years ago when he got bored with it? Where do you put the fiddle if you've given up learning to be a fiddle player, stick it in the loft. So my advice to you out there in internet land is peidiwch a rhoi'r fiddl yn y to. Peidiwch a rhoi'r fiddl yn y to. Don't give up. Don't give up. Uh, it's a good time to give up right now when we're all locked down and tired and miserable, but don't you give up, because in a thousand years somebody will dig you up and find a sword in your grave and be freaked out by that. Uh, they're going to find a sword in my grave. I'm getting buried with a sword. 100%. 100%. And I already know that some of my osteology is a little androgynous. So they're going to have a fun time figuring out if I'm a man or a woman. Uh, especially if I remove my head and pelvis from the grave. Maybe I'll just do that and take my skull and my pelvis out of the grave. Anyway, dear my gown. In my theatre, I'm William Akam Minna Avi. Thank you very much once again for watching and for joining me. Tanatronissa. Till the next time. Bye for now. Happy International Women's Day. Tea leaf. What was in the tea leaf? Oh my god.